Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Last Sunday's texts were about the Holy Spirit of God since it was Pentecost. And uh, by that time, I had read the, the texts for today, and I noticed that today's gospel is also about the Spirit of God. Here, Jesus calls the Spirit the Spirit of Truth. So I told Pastor Chad on the way out last Sunday that he had stolen absolutely everything that I was planning to say today. <laughs> and he said, well, then maybe you can skip the sermon. <laughs> or maybe the Holy Spirit will go to work on you and you'll come up with something. We'll see, we'll see. I'd like to focus on two, two thoughts about God's spirit today, God's spirit and truth. Truth is also a word that seems to be very important in today's text. Number one, God's truth is fixed and permanent for all time. And number two, God's truth is also throbbing with life. It is on the move. It's always out ahead of us. Truth is fixed, first of all. A long time ago, the people of God decided that there, were, there are some absolutes in this faith, things that would never change. God created the world. God is the source of all life. God loves this world. And so they put that together, and the term Father seemed to describe for them what this was all about. And then the people of God met Jesus, and he really surprised them because they discovered that he too is God. He died, he rose again from the dead, and, and, and he obviously had conquered death, and he gives new life to people. So that truth became also an article of their faith. We see God in Jesus. And then another surprise came when they found out that this same Jesus and this same creator God was still among them in a brand new way after Jesus' death and resurrection. And they called that unmistakable presence of God the Holy Spirit, creator, savior, teacher all the same God among them. They were sure of it. And so the people of God put these things together, these things they had experienced, these things they knew. They put it into words. They put it into creeds and doctrines and into the scriptures. <clears throat> and they intended that these truths should be basic to the faith for all time because they were dependable. They are words about God the Father and the Son and God the Holy Spirit, words about who God is and what God has done. And so for all these many hundreds of years now, the people of God have been gathering around those basic core truths over and over and over again, and so do we because we believe that these, are the, these words are the foundation of our faith, the foundation of our hope of eternal life. Then we hear today in, in, in the, the gospel, Jesus telling his followers that that's not all there is to the truth. You have more to learn, he says. He says the spirit, which is himself really, although they don't know that yet, the Spirit will continue among them to declare to them the things that are still to come. And so he means then, I think, that people can look up from these things that they know and can look around and, that, and, and, and see that there is more to learn, more to do. That truth is like a springboard. And we can maybe, we can even say that we don't know everything there is to know about God. We live in mystery. 
we live in anticipation. Maybe the Bible does not have an answer to every question we may ask of it. And so that's the second focus here for today, that God's truth is also full of life. There's more beyond us. God's truth cannot be harnessed and confined merely to words and statements. There are discoveries still to be made. God is bigger than all of our words. I think we, we likely know people who try to confine God and Jesus and all of Christian knowledge and uh, Christian experience and Christian ethics into laws and statements of some kind, maybe into constitutions and bylaws, rules, and some of these find their way into politics, we've discovered. <clears throat> Some people can take a single Bible verse and turn that into a whole big theology or a religious law of some kind. And with that, they think they can either beat up on other people or they can somehow fix them. These people, uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't doubt that they're very devout, but I think I, for one, find them insuffer insufferable. A man, a man who was absolutely convinced on the basis of what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14 and in 1 Timothy 2, that women have no business being pastors and no business be having authority over men in the church. He confronted me, and I had just uh, finished serving uh, with a female pastoral partner for seven years, and at that time I was serving as an assistant to Bishop April Larson in the La Crosse Area Synod. He said, so what could you possibly learn? He said, what could you learn being an assistant to a woman who the Bible says shouldn't be in, in, in ministry in the first place, much less a bishop? What have you learned, he said. And I said, well, many good things among them I've had to learn since there's only one restroom in the synod office to always put the seat down. <laughs> I, I should also learn, I suppose, that sarcasm isn't all that helpful in, in some of those situations where somebody is so absolutely sure that he or she knows what is right, not only for themselves, but for everybody else. I, uh, I irritated him, I know. I have to admit the uh, occasional delight, though, in that sort of thing. <laughs> but the saddest part of that conversation was that that man was my older brother. So there are these folks who try to contain God and God's truth in some way. Jesus is saying, don't do that. <clears throat> lift up your heads, lift up your eyes, and keep looking ahead because there's more to discover, and my spirit will guide you. Jesus seems to be saying here that the, the truth is also a way to live because we start with the words about God that are important to know, the words about Jesus, but then Jesus needs to come to life. The things we know about God and about Jesus have a therefore about them. Would you believe there are just short of 800 therefores in the Bible? And no, I didn't read the whole thing and count them. I cheated and used a concordance. And I, but there are, there are 800 or so, and then there are all kinds of expressions that imply the same thing. It must be an important idea. And most of the time you discover that it's immediately following or it's in connection with God doing something or Jesus saying something. And so that therefore is meant to get the person up from a focus on the words or what has just happened and then bring them to life. Do something. How does that word you just heard, how does that action of Jesus you just saw, how does that make a difference? 
One, ex one example of how, of how this is, is is the Romans passage uh, for today. <clears throat> we read, because we are set right with God by faith, that's part of that core truth that we've been given, God does it, therefore, we have peace, and we are enabled to endure, and we are enabled to grow in character and in hope, because God's love keeps being poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Do you see it? Every bit of that action is all about God's action, God's gift. It's all pure grace. But then when God does something or says something, there's that haunting therefore about it that points us into a way to live. And, and even that way to live, then, is empowered and enabled by God. That's when truth comes to life among us. Yes, it's a haunting word. And most often it's a call of some kind, so pay attention when you come to those therefores. So this, this is the second point today. There's more truth to learn, more to be lived. So. If that first point, that, that God's timeless truth is solid and permanent for all time, that might make good students and good scholars as we study that, and that's, that's very good. Then this point is that God's truth also makes adventurers out of us. We live out the therefores, where the Spirit of God lives. That's where the Spirit of God lives. When I think of the connection between God's truth and, and, and God's spirit, I sometimes think of fireflies. They are, they are little bugs that delight us with uh, flashes of light in the, in the darkness, but they're very hard to catch. And if you do capture one and you try to save it somehow in a jar, it doesn't stay alive very long. But when it is free, then it's fascinating. It can, it can tell you what direction it's going, and if you pay attention, you can follow it. And so it is with the Spirit of God. One is given a, a moment now and then, a moment of grace, an insight of some kind, maybe clarity on some decision, or an awareness that a burden has been lifted it might come when one is at worship or when one is in prayer or it might come in a conversation with another person or it might just show up unexpectedly like a flash of light in the darkness. And it's not an answer to everything, but it gives, a direct, it gives us a direction and it keeps us moving. And these moments we are given can lead us more deeply into the truth, as Jesus said. But try to put those moments and those insights, those experiences, into some kind of formula that always applies and can be used as a, a, a kind of test for other people. When it's, not, it's like trying to capture a firefly and trying to save it in a jar. It soon loses its ability to fascinate anybody. It gets cold. It dies. So the Spirit of God gives a direction. The Spirit of God leads us toward living a compassionate life, a generous life, a life of justice and peace, a life of forgiveness and grace, a life of honesty and hospitality and joy always leading us onward more deeply into becoming more like the presence of Jesus in this world. <coughs> Excuse me. The Spirit gives direction, but also leaves us the freedom to decide the specific ways we're going to do this. <clears throat> and they won't be the same for everybody. <clears throat> but when we do anything in response to God's love, when we do anything in response to Jesus' love for us, then truth comes to life. 
the scriptures promise us that whatever is done in the name of the Lord Jesus is never done in vain. <coughs> Final thought, I think I can make this. I think it's significant that when, when Jesus makes this promise that the Spirit will continue to teach and lead his followers deeper into the truth, he is speaking to his gathered disciples. I think he wants to make it clear that no one person has all the truth. The insight into what God is doing, the insight into the things to come that Jesus talks about, the the richness and joy and adventure that God has in mind for us are not meant for private performance. All of what God has done and all of what God has given that keeps us grounded is meant to be enjoyed and celebrated and studied together. We help one another understand all those basic things. <coughs> but then we also encourage one another to discover the unique gifts that each of us has and to live them and use them for the sake of one another in our daily lives. And the things that we cannot do alone, we pitch in and gladly do together. And I see all kinds of evidence of that in this place. I want to tell you personally, <coughs> I am so glad to be a part of this congregation where these things I've been talking about here, sort of, these things I've been saying here are, are this congregation's normal way of life. Thanks be to God.